the first condition we will talk about in regards to neuro neurological diseases and di disorders is epilepsy and seizure disorders. When we say that someone has had a seizure, technically we mean this person has had a spontaneous, uncontrolled electrical activity among the cerebral neurons. So this is contraction of the muscles that is out of control. The person has absolutely no control o over it. This is a seizure. Actually, it's estimated that about 10% of us will have at least one seizure sometime in our life. So seizures themselves are not that uncommon. However, if we have repeated seizures, so these are seizures that are unprovoked, um, that's when we will consider the diagnosis of epilepsy. So um, one seizure, you know, we may see a lot of patients that just have one episode in their lifetime and it's never repeated again. So that's what we would say, oh, that's just one seizure. But if for no apparent reason a person has more than two episodes, then we would consider that epilepsy. Worldwide, the prevalence of epilepsy is about 1%. And uh, we can see that that's a lot lower than the 10% of the population that will have a seizure um, at one time in their life. So what causes seizures and epilepsy? Well, it could be head trauma, infection to the central nervous system, um, abuse of different drugs and alcohol, cancer, and CVD. Um, that's cerebral vascular disease in this case, not cardiovascular. So all of these could trigger a epilepsy and seizure but in the case of epilepsy, um, in the majority of these cases, they usually don't have any of these precipitating events. And that's what makes this difficult because, you know, let's say if someone has a seizure after a head trauma, then hopefully we deal with the trauma and the seizures go away. So in many cases, patients who have had trauma can outgrow their seizures once the trauma has been dealt with. Unfortunately, many other cases don't have any of these precipitating or underlying diseases or events, so the individual just has repeated seizure attacks, and that's when it becomes more challenging to manage. So during seizure episodes, um, which could last anywhere from a few seconds to several minutes, um, during the episodes, the nervous system will be engaged in a lot of abnormal uncontrolled electrical activity, and this could affect either the whole brain or um, just parts, uh, partial areas of the brain. For generalized seizure, the electrical activity of the neurons affect the entire brain. Therefore, this is obviously going to be more severe. And there are different types of seizure that would be categorized under generalized seizure. Um, we have the tonic-clonic, um, which in the past has been referred to as the grand mal seizure. So this grand mal literally meaning something big and bad, and this has a mixture of symptoms. Then we have something minor called absence, and this the previous name here was petite mal, so still something bad, but small. So compared to the tonic, clonic generalized seizure, the symptoms are a lot more mild. Sometimes when the patient has these absence episodes, they could, you know, for instance, be sitting in a cafeteria, having lunch with friends, and then suddenly the person stops communicating, they're not responding to their friends any longer. And to an outsider, it just looks like the person is staring at something, just not responding. Then, you know, after a moment of time, the person will resume normal function. So, 
you know, this is, would be a minor episode of the seizure. Then if a seizure only affects certain areas of the brain, that's called a partial seizure. We have the simple partial seizure, and um, that means that the area affected is uh, relatively minor. Actually, in this case, um, a lot of the patients that have partial simple seizures uh, can remain aware during the event. So after the seizure occurs, they can recall afterwards, all right, I was doing this when it happened and during the process, this is what I felt. So they can actually describe it to you. But then we also have the more complex partial seizures in which patients may not be aware and after the episode, they cannot recall what happened. They may come out of it confused. And actually, many of these individuals can have a sense that the seizure is coming on because they've had it before, so from previous experience. And this allows them to stop what they are doing and allow the seizure to run its course. For example, there are reports of individuals who were driving and then they felt a seizure coming on and this actually gave them time and allowed them to pull over and park the car and allow the episode to run its course and then once it's over, it's over. But of course in certain cases there is no say self prediction at all. They they don't feel any sort of symptoms that would warn them that a seizure is coming on. So they may just, you know, fall and then start a seizure episode. So these are the clinical manifestation of seizure and epilepsy. And as we can see, they are highly varied. So how do we diagnose these conditions? Well, we use a electroencephalogram or EEG. And so we can monitor the brain activity um, under normal conditions or during a seizure or shortly after a seizure. So um, depending on what state the patient's in, there are different patterns of a, a curve that allows um, physicians to make a diagnosis. And this right here, um, this image is a picture of someone with the EEG um, device on and it's connected to a machine that monitors their um, electrical activity in the brain. Also, we rely on medical imaging, for example, CT and MRI scans to also check the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, for example, to see if there are any other changes. So, um, for example, if the seizure is caused by a tumor, then these technologies would allow us to identify the cancer mass. Medical treatment of these conditions includes um, medication, so anti-epileptic drugs or AEDs. These medications are effective in about 70% of the patients. However, they do come with side effects. So if we think about the pathophysiology of seizures, patients have these episodes because the neurons are having uncontrolled electrical activity. So these medications target those neurons so that the um, active potential will come down, but that also means these cells are not sending out the signals for other things as well as they normally would be. Therefore, side effects could affect the normal functions that we would want. For example, people on AEDs may feel drowsy, sleepy, having really low energy all day long. So this low energy status, you know, could prevent a seizure. But if this was in a student who was in college, then it wouldn't allow them to be able to focus and um, they would probably have difficulty studying. Um, another common um, side effect of AED, depending on the medication, we could see the side effects of weight loss or weight gain as well. 
So the remaining 30% of patients that do not respond well to AEDs, um, in those cases, surgical treatment could be considered. And depending on the type of seizure, the area of the brain affected, um, there are different ways that the surgeries can be performed. So these surgeries do put patients at high risk, not only for fatality, but also for loss of function post-surgery. So we need to understand that these changes would be permanent. So for example, if a certain part of the brain is removed, or the connection to certain parts of the brain are disrupted through the surgery, then there is no way to go back or roll back the change. So it's a very serious treatment. This table here summarizes the usual medications that are used to um, treat epilepsy. So for us, we want to pay special attention to this column here, the um, interactions potential uh, food and drug interactions. And if we look at these, a lot of them have interactions that affect GI function. So there are definitely certain things that we wouldn't want to pair them with. Um, so please keep all of this in mind and know the general um, issues of potential interaction. But if you do see a patient on a specific medication, please be sure to um, look up what the specific side effects or interaction would be. When it comes to nutrition therapy, the ketogenic diet is best known for um, nutrition treatment of seizure and epilepsy. This concept was actually evolved from some ancient treatments in which fasting was used to treat people with seizures or epilepsy. Now, if we think about the adaptation to starvation, um, I think we studied this in depth in advanced nutrition. During long-term starvation, our body will eventually um, mobilize lipolysis, and then that will lead to ketogenesis. Therefore, the ketogenic diet therapy for epilepsy tries to imitate this adaptation to prolong starvation. So these diets contain high fats, but a low amount of carbohydrates. And we know this combination over time will deplete our carbohydrate storage, and then we will have to go into mobilizing lipids. So this is the mechanism behind it. For people with um, intractable epilepsy, meaning that they are not responding very well to the AED medications, the ketogenic um, diet could be valid, especially uh, in the use, we use it a lot in children. But exactly how the ketogenic diet with high ketosis could help control the epilepsy, these mechanisms are still not very well understood. So under this category of the ketogenic diet, we have different types of diet variations. So this table gives a nice summary of the classical um, ketogenic diet that we see here, and then also um, shows us about some of the modifications or um, variations of the ketogenic diet. So please be sure to read this table um, after the lecture and pay attention, of course, to the features as well as the suitabilities. So the main differences among the different variations of the ketogenic diet are the macronutrient compositions. For example, different diets will have different um, carbohydrate intake. Some are more liberal while others are more restrictive. And if we recall what we learned about a high fat diet and weight control, so for example, using the Atkins diet, we know low carb diets, in addition to promoting ketosis, can also lead to certain reactions. And basically patients you know, may not be feeling as satisfied after a meal due to the low carb content. So 
So this is something we need to keep in mind. And there are other factors in these diets as well. For example, MCT. Um, this ketogenic diet is unique. Um, it also includes MCT oil, but this happens to be more expensive and would cost the patient more to be on it for a long period of time. And generally in children, they'll follow these diets for maybe two to three years and then see if they might be able to go back to a normal diet without seeing um, the seizures come back. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. So for nutrition implications for these patients with epilepsy, they may have an adequate nutrient intake. Therefore, we want to ensure that they have adequate energy intake. They may also have limited food choices. So this is actually a common observation of this population, especially for people with epilepsy when they have the repeated seizure episodes. They tend to have very peculiar food preferences in terms of texture, taste, flavor, and other things. So this could really limit their food choices. Um, I'm not aware of an explanation for these you know, changes in food choices or having um, certain food preferences, but it's not uncommon among people with neurological disorders. For example, dementia patients, like Alzheimer patients, they are reported to have these types of preferences. So it's very possible that due to the disease condition, um, the capturing of things like the flavor or taste signals by the peripheral receptors are processed differently by the altered neurons in the brain. So the patients may have a different perception of how sweet or how smooth foods are. Um, also, you know, drug nutrient interactions, we already went through that and um, you have a list to refer to. So in general, any medication that works on neurological symptoms could have a potential effect on the GI tract, um, among other systems, because that's how it works, right? Um, it affects the signals of the neurotransmitters, so um, it would make sense that we might see some of these side effects. So this table summarizes the nutritional assessment of a disease of the whole neurologic system. So it's not just for epilepsy. So please be sure to go through this carefully. I do wanna point out a few things. Um, because we are working within the neurological system, we can see certain assessments are specific to the system. For example, in client history, we check for the neurological impairment of um, cranial nerves. So these cranial nerves have pairs, one on the right side and one on the left side. And um, it's connected to other parts of the body. And cranial nerve number 12 uh, affects swallowing. So, you know, that would be one that we would want to pay attention to as well as these other ones that affect things like taste, um, our ability to maintain balance or to hear. So these are all very important. Potential problems for nutrition diagnosis. Um, we see here, we've already mentioned that it could be, uh, the patient could have excessive or an adequate intake depending on the patient's preference of food, um, or also if they're on a medication that maybe decreases or increases their appetite, that would be something that would affect intake. Um, and if the intake for the long term is not adequate, then malnutrition would be possible. Food medication interactions definitely is very common and um, predicted suboptimal energy intake um, that would be, you know, connected to this inadequate intake. 
Nutrition intervention, we already mentioned the ketogenic diets. Um, this is what we do, especially in children with intractable epilepsy. Our focus is to provide adequate energy, protein, and macronutrients. So here's an example of a ketogenic diet for a five-year-old. So we see here that um, the energy requirement is only 1,200 calories, and this is due to the age. So we can look at the different meals. We have four meals here throughout the day, um, providing 1,200 calories in total. So what we need to pay attention to is the fat to protein and carb ratio. So looking at these numbers here. So basically what this is telling us is that in each meal they're getting 30 grams of fat and then their protein, grams of protein and grams of carbs is equal to 7.5 grams. So um, the ratio among these macronutrients is one to, uh, is four to one. So we provide more fat than the other two, and we want to maintain this throughout the day. So typical diets, you'll see the fat to protein and carb ratios to be about three to one or four to one. So this will guarantee that they won't have enough carbohydrates to prevent ketosis. Then uh, their bodies will have to mobilize lipolysis and the extra acetylcholine from the beta oxidation of fatty acids will be sent to the liver for ketogenesis. And this is how ketosis begins. To monitor and evaluate the nutrition therapy and make sure that it's working in epileptic patients, um, because in a ketogenic diet, you know, this is our main tool or weapon, we want to check if ketosis is actually occurring. So for this, we have a serum marker for ketosis called beta-hydroxybutyrate or, or BHB. So this should be requested as a lab um, if it's already not if it's not already done in addition to standard labs. So things like the reg regular metabolic panel and your urine, urine sample analysis, et cetera. So we do know in high ketosis, urinary um, ketones would become positive. So we really wanna keep this in mind. So we can monitor ketones through either the, uh, through blood samples or also through the urine. And talking about the ketogenic diet, we can think about what we know about something like the Atkins diet. So during the initiation phase of Atkins, uh, one thing the individual needs to check for in their, is their urine ketone. So when this becomes positive, that's an indication that the diet has kicked in because ketosis has kicked in. Also, in uncontrolled diabetes, um, we can see diabetic ketoacidosis and urinary ketones would also be positive. But remember, this is also in conjunction with hormonal irregularities like either the absence of insulin or insulin resistance. So the amount of ketones produced in diabetic ketoacidosis is very high and there are hormonal imbalances which can lead to fatal outcomes if not treated. So for example, um, think about if we had a child that has type one diabetes and um, you know, we tried all the medica and also has epilepsy and we tried all the medications, but they're still having um, seizures. They're not responding to the medications. Then we could try to uh, manage their seizures with a ketogenic diet but we would need to be vigilant um, on monitoring their insulin regimen as well as ketone monitoring to ensure that they do not develop DKA. So thinking about all these conditions, although they have um, different diseases or um, you know, reasons for occurring, the passive 
physiology does have similarity. In this case, it would be an adequate carbohydrate intake, and um, this would cause a high level of lipolysis to occur. So in addition to the nutrient and energy intake, of course, the ultimate outcome is that um, we want to see seizures decrease. So checking the seizure frequency records, um, we want to see that with the nutrition therapy and other medical therapy, that the patient seizures are getting better and less frequent. 